It's Leo for actualized.org. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the ego's favorite defense mechanism, distraction. Why aren't more people conscious? In a word, distraction, distraction, distraction. Distraction is such a sneaky phenomenon. It's amazing. It will amaze you. It will both amaze you and horrify you once you see the full depth of it as you get deeper and deeper into this work. And you start to really go inside, really work on yourself. Man, you're in for some uh, rude awakening. It really is a rude awakening. Now, the ego has many defense mechanisms. And uh, why is that the case? Because they're needed to keep the illusion of the ego alive. Now, by ego, of course, I mean you. You are the ego. Not some part of you, but you, the one that I'm talking to right now, the one that I'm addressing, the one that I'm pointing at, that you, what that thing is, your entire self, not a part of yourself, but yourself, the very essence of yourself, that thing there, that's what I'm pointing to, that thing is the illusion. And of course, that thing wants to stay alive. If an illusion wants to stay alive, it has to use all sorts of sleights of hand to make it happen, you see. So even though the ego has many defense mechanisms, one of its strongest ones is distraction because it's so sneaky. It's necessary because if you didn't distract yourself, you would inevitably discover the truth about yourself which is that there's no you in there. And that's unacceptable to you. You see? You see the irony here? You see the paradox? It's uh, really quite a mindfuck. Now, when I talk about distraction, what do I mean? I'm not just talking about video games and Facebook as a distraction. Of course, those are distractions that many people fall prey to, but to think that I'm merely talking about you clicking on Facebook and wasting time playing video games and that that is the distraction, that itself is the distraction to think that that's the distraction. You see, that's peanuts compared to the real distraction. The real distraction is not that stuff. It's your entire life. Your entire life. Everything you're doing in your life has the big picture goal of distracting you from discovering existential truth, from turning inwards and seeing what you're really made out of. That's what the business, the busyness of life is about. I'm talking about your work your career, business, pursuing success, pursuing money, family, relationships, friendships, socialization, talking, thinking, debating, arguing, trying to save the world, doing good in the world, education, politics, church, religion, technology, science, these are all distractions. See? The ego creates all these things, in a sense. I, I, this is just, I mean, I have to be careful here. Because I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Because then people will say that, oh, this is so ridiculous, it's so impractical. Look, there are redeeming qualities to these things. I'm not saying they're all totally bad and that they shouldn't exist. I'm just saying that in the big picture... What the ego is doing is it's using these as human shields 
to keep you from really doing the inner work that you got to do to become conscious in life. You see, they're very convenient distractions. Now, people misunderstand this notion of distraction because they think like, oh, well, a distraction is a very frivolous thing. No, 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 no. To have a really high quality distraction, you distract yourself not with a frivolous thing, you distract yourself with the most fucking important thing in the world. Things like your career, money, family, talking, thinking, science, politics, religion, all these things are held by most human beings as the most important things in the world. I mean, what is more important than that? You see, and that is the distraction. It's a sleight of hand that the mind plays with your priorities in life which gets you to have the wrong priorities in life, which gets you pursuing the wrong things in life. That's what I'm talking about. Not just video games. See, it's easy to think of video games as a distraction. Of course they are a distraction, and many people waste their entire lives or their entire um, teenage years or whatever uh, playing thousands of hours of video games, and that's a big problem. That keeps a lot of people from becoming conscious. That becomes an addiction. And there are many of these addictions, and I've talked about them in the past. I have many episodes where we've sort of covered this topic, but we're hitting it from different angles because it's really goddamn important. I have an episode called uh, 30 Ways Society Fucks You in the Ass. That's the chimp episode where I ranted a bit about the chimpdom of society and how society really holds you back from doing this work. So that's an important episode that ties in with this one, if you can recall. Uh, I also talked about uh, minimizing your lifestyle in my lifestyle minimalism episode. So you might remember that one. Uh, overcoming addictions. That's another episode that I have, which sort of dovetails with what I'm talking about here. But here, I really want to focus on the distraction part so that you start to notice this. It's really beneficial for you to start to see and become mindful of the distraction that's going on personally in your life, how your mind is creating the distractions. They're always very well justified. Always. Always. Your worst distractions are the ones that don't seem like distractions at all. That's what's so sneaky about it. That is the sleight of hand which creates the illusion and then perpetuates the illusion. What are you being distracted from? From turning inwards. From really facing existential truth and reality. And that's something I've talked about uh, quite a bit in my Absolute Infinity episodes and in my Enlightenment episodes. But it's not just Enlightenment. Of course you're delaying Enlightenment, because that's sort of the culmination of all this. But not just Enlightenment, but just turning inwards and introspecting. Living the contemplative sort of lifestyle. The way the Greeks talked about. Um, it's becoming more conscious about all sorts of facets of life, becoming more conscious about how business works, becoming more conscious about how money works, becoming more conscious about politics, about spirituality, about your thought process, right? So there's a lot of facets in life where you need to become a lot more conscious, not just enlightenment, although that's important. And so the distraction is to keep you from doing that. And why? Is there this distraction? Why is there this conspiracy? It seems like I'm making it sound like a conspiracy theory. Well, it's not really a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Your mind just has to work this way because it can't exist otherwise. You see, your very existence is predicated upon an illusion. It's almost as though you were a magician who, whose life depended on him being able to fool himself into thinking he exists. And to do that, he has to be a really good magician. Now you might say, Leo, that's very paradoxical. That can't, how does that work? If he's the magician creating the magic trick to fool himself, that he doesn't ex but he doesn't actually exist, and he's fooling himself that he does exist, doesn't that prove that he actually exists? And the answer is no, it doesn't. That's the illusion. You can see through that illusion, and that's the thing that requires turning inwards. It's, it is it is it uh, is mind-bending. It is paradoxical. 
fundamentally, what is a distraction? A distraction works like this. We make some noise over there so that no one looks over here. And then we stall out the clock. That's the ego's game here. To win the game, the ego, by which I mean you, you, not some part of it, but you, you merely need to stall out the clock. So you distract yourself for 50, 60 years of your life. And then by that point, you're too old, you're too sick, you're too stubborn, you're too mentally rigid to care about anything. And then you die. And that's the end of the game. And the ego won. You won. Because you persisted as you. That's the game that's being played here. All the mind has to do is just stall out the clock with distractions. See, because you could easily spend 50 years of your life doing business, chasing money, chasing women, having children, going to school, and going on vacations, and playing video games, and going to church, and saving the world, and doing all this sort of stuff. But you never discover yourself. I really want you to, to grasp this. Let this sink in that 99, not just 99%, but 99.99999% of all human beings on the earth die without ever discovering who they actually are. That's a rather shocking statistical fact. It's rather outrageous that thousands of years into human civilization, this is still going on. You would think we would have had some made some inroads over the last two to five thousand years. I mean, human civilization, we think of it as two thousand years old, but actually it's way older than that. Big civilizations like ancient Egypt have been uh <laughs> have been running for, for since 5,000 years ago. It's quite amazing. And, and we're making new discoveries all the time that keep pushing back the time where civilizations existed five, 7,000 years ago, and even before that, really. There were cities. And this issue of discovering who you were, this issue of enlightenment, this issue of consciousness, this is not a new thing. This is not some new age thing. This is the oldest these are the oldest truths that human beings discovered. Human beings discovered this at least 10,000 years ago, if not way before that, when we were still living in little huts and little tribes of 50 to 100 people. People knew about these truths. But as civilization became more mainstream and it really blossomed and ballooned, and now we have this population explosion, we think that our technology is making things better. But actually, look at the statistics. 99.99999% of people, even very educated, very intelligent, very scientific, I mean, you name it, people with the highest IQs, it doesn't matter. None of these things matter when it comes to discovering the truth of what reality is. They die before they discover this truth. Uh, which means that they are defeated by distraction. That's what that means. That's why this point is so damn important. It's really worth reflecting on. And this point about distraction, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it from the very macro sort of uh, species-wide perspective, but also we need to drill it down to your particular path as you're self-actualizing, which you're going to start to notice is just how much distraction there is going on in your life and how sneaky it is and why it's happening. And then I want you to connect what's happening in you and why it's so difficult to, to, to see the distraction happening in you and then to resist it. And then to see that in other people and to see that in the whole species. And then you see, that, oh my God, as, as a human species, as the human race, we are just babies in this process. See, if we had like 60% of people failing, but 40% succeeding, 
in discovering the truth of who they were, then we would say, okay, we're making good progress. But right now we're at 99.99999% failure rate. That's abysmal. It's abysmal. That should clue you in into the depth of the self-deception and the sneakiness and the sleight of hand involved. Just how strong and powerful of an illusion this is. When something is said to be an illusion, don't mistake that to be some flimsy thing. This is a very solid illusion. I'm talking about your entire sense of reality. The fact that you think there is a physical reality. That whole notion is an illusion. And the fact that some people think that what I'm saying here is somehow controversial or outrageous just shows you how deep the illusion goes. And even with, when you agree with me, it doesn't help you to dispel the illusion. The illusion is still there. Part of the illusion is agreeing with me. And so, nodding your head and saying, yes, Leo, yes, this is all so good. I'm going to watch more videos and let's keep doing all this and growing ourselves. But see, that's still part of the illusion. It's all part of the distraction. You've got to become very vigilant to the tricks that your mind can play on you. There's this notion called the red herring. Have you heard this term used before in popular culture? It's an interesting term. I actually had to look it up. In, um, in the United Kingdom, I think it's where this term sort of originated from, is they have actual herrings that they, I mean, herrings are, are popular food there. They're not popular in the U.S. or other parts of the world. So you got herring up there in the north, right? And what they do is they smoke it and they, they salt it. And when they do, it gets a sort of a reddish appearance. You can actually Google and see what a red herring looks like. It's pretty interesting. It looks very red. But the reason that they call it a red herring and um, this notion came about is because the, the herring is so smelly once it's smoked and salted that there's this story that some guy used the red herring to distract his hounds from chasing some rabbits with the, the pungent smell of this red herring. And so that's what the notion red herring means. Red herring means it's a distraction. It's something that I flash in your face, some sort of flashy object. I flash it over here. You get so preoccupied with looking at that thing that you don't look at the elephant in the room. And that's what happens is that people go through their whole life, very successful people, very intelligent people, uh, I mean, our universities, our top universities are filled with such people, and yet they never see the elephant in the room, which is the nature of who they are and what reality is. They miss it because, well, one of the distractions is intelligence, IQ, university credentials. If you're a professor or a scientist, people just tend to assume that, oh, well, that, that saves me from this problem. No, it doesn't. It only makes the problem worse. Whenever you think you've avoided the tricks of the mind, watch out. That's when the mind has succeeded in tricking you. One of the ultimate examples of a red herring in this situation is religion. Huge red herring. The sneakiness of religion is astounding. It's astounding at how successful religion is at misleading people from discovering the truth of who they are. Precisely because the whole function of religion in, in name is to get you to the truth. That's why religion is there. That's why it got created in the first place. It wasn't created in the first place by some um, woo-woo people. It was created by people who discovered the truth. But the way that religion evolved and morphed and was bastardized by the ego to serve its own ends, turned it into the ultimate distraction trap so that people can go and start doing religion and they can get really into it. And then they think and they feel as though they actually are getting to the truth and really they're headed in exactly the opposite direction. You see, that's how sneaky this stuff is. Just when you think that you have got one up 
on your mind, your mind has one up on you. It's amazing. It's amazing when you start to pull these layers back in your own psyche and you start to see this actually at work and then you connect it to everything that's going on in society and you start to see what our society really is. It's just amazing. If you start to do self-inquiry, if you start to get serious about this, you start asking yourself questions like, who am I? What am I? You start meditating. What you can immediately notice is that even when you make a little bit of progress, maybe even especially when you make some good progress in this consciousness work, you will fall off track. Something will come up in your life, something important. Something will come and distract you. And this is the most amazing phenomenon because it just happens over and over and over again on this path. It's not that you're going to get distracted once, twice, or three times. You're going to get distracted dozens, hundreds of times in this whole process. This whole awakening process is you just constantly being tricked over and over and over again and seduced and distracted with red herrings away off the path. You have to wonder if 99.99999% of people don't get to the truth. <laughs> Why is that? It's because the mechanism of the mind has so many red herrings to distract people that it's almost a miracle that anyone gets there at all. It's like you're being asked to walk through a minefield that's 10 miles long and it's just littered with mines. You would be very lucky to come out alive through 10 miles of walking in that minefield. See? What happens in the awakening process is that you awaken by 1%. Then you fall back down and you forget. Then you remember a month later and you awaken by another 1%. Then you fall back down, backslide, and you forget. Maybe for a whole year. Then you remember you, again, like, oh yeah, I used to be awake. And I want to get back to that place. And then you work on yourself, you meditate, you self-inquire, and then you wake up 2%. And then you forget. Something distracts you. Society distracts you. That's his job. That's religion's job. That's your career's job is to make you busy, to chase your tail in a circle. You just chase it around, chase it around until you're dead. That's what it means to be a self. That's what it means to be you. That's what you are, the false you, the you that thinks that it's separate from me, thinks that it's separate from the whole world, that one. What you'll discover is that there are infinite distractions in society. Even if you just go on a solo meditation retreat, when you're outside of society and you just sit there and now you're saying, okay, now I'm going to meditate or now I'm going to self-inquire. You're still going to have infinite distractions at your disposal. All the tricks. Your mind is going to say, oh, well, let's go for a walk. It's a beautiful day outside. So you'll go for a walk and that'll be your distraction. And then your mind will say, oh, look at that cute squirrel that you see on your walk. Oh, and then you're going to look at the squirrel and that's going to be a distraction. See, the distractions can be very um, micro. They can be very macro, but they can also be very micro. Your thoughts can be a distraction. You might be sitting there. You might even spend 10 days all by yourself in, in a cabin in the woods. But what are you going to have there but uh, a cyclone of thoughts? Thought after thought after thought. Each one of those is a distraction. And they're so sneaky and they're so juicy and they're so addictive. Basically, your mind will do anything to avoid looking inwards. It has to look outwards. That's its modus operandi. Then it can function and then it can survive. Your very life depends on this, you see. This is a high stakes game for you. At least you feel that way until after you awaken. Once you awaken and you look back in retrospect, then you see, oh my God, I see the sham of this whole thing. But when you're in the middle of the storm, the ego storm, when you're right in the eye of the ego storm, 
it really feels like, oh man, this is, this is how life is. This is just how life is. And it's very scary just to, to want to walk out of it. Because you are facing your death there. Your mind tricks you into chasing after career, business, success, money, family, relationships, sex, reading books, preaching to people, trying to save the world, arguing, criticizing, intellectualizing, philosophizing, educating yourself, uh, getting involved in political debates, getting involved with drama, with tabloids, with sex, with porn. I mean, like, drugs. Like, it doesn't end. You see how many options society gives you? And the more our society advances, the worse this problem gets. It doesn't really get better. It gets worse. Wait till virtual reality happens. Right now, virtual reality is still shit. But in 10, 20 years, when virtual reality gets good, oh boy, watch out. Watch out. Imagine virtual reality porn. Imagine virtual reality Facebook. Imagine virtual reality internet. Imagine virtual reality video games. Uh, humanity's going to be really fucked if we don't um, if we don't prioritize consciousness above technological growth. People don't realize, for example, that your entire career could be one giant defense mechanism, one giant distraction or red herring from discovering the truth. Your entire career. People right now who are billionaires, who have devoted their entire lives to building corporations and companies and earning lots of money, they don't realize that that is a red herring. They are missing the elephant in the room, which is truth, which is consciousness, which they should be pursuing. Uh, a great example of this also with careers that are red herrings is uh, conservative talk show hosts, people like Rush Limbaugh or folks you see on the Fox News channel. And I'm not saying uh, liberals are immune to this as well. I mean, liberals also fall prey to this, but, but these conservative talk show hosts, they make their entire careers and lives about talking and bloviating uh, endlessly about their ideology. And that becomes a whole career for them. They can earn lots of money, like Alex Jones comes to mind, earn lots of money doing this. Your entire career can just suck you into this and you don't see that you're missing the elephant in the room and that you're just chasing a red herring. And you, those people, are gonna die. Those people will die not even knowing what they missed. They're not even going to know. They're not. They're, it's going to be completely clueless about what they missed, which is the saddest and most tragic part about this. As great as your life might seem, if you're just living it in the ordinary fashion, uh, you cannot even comprehend what it's like to awaken. And one of the most amazing things is that when you do awaken, even a little bit, even just get a glimpse for a few hours, that's good enough, um, to get you to realize like, oh my God, I, I, I came this close, this close to missing it. If not, but for a few fortunate circumstances in my life, I would have been just like everybody else. I would have missed it. And how sad that would have been. I would have missed the whole point of life. Society is a collective ego distraction. That's its function. Many of the mechanisms society are designed to keep your ego perpetually stimulated and uh, chasing its own tails, which is precisely why many yogis and monks choose to go live in caves up in mountaintops or build monasteries far away from society. They become ascetics, hermits, recluses. And in mainstream society, we have a negative stereotype about this. So when I tell people, oh, I want to go live in a cave, sometimes I, I put that out there as a fantasy of mine. Um, and then people have these negative reactions like, oh, Leo, well, if you're talking about living in a cave, that's so far out there. That's so radical. That's so anti-life. It's so anti what I want my life to be. But have you noticed the knee-jerk reaction 
that you have against living on a mountaintop in a cave. A lot of people just have a negative reaction against this. And the reason that is, is not because living in a cave is bad. It's because you've been brainwashed by society into this thing called life. Life as you know it is life within mainstream society. You don't know any other kind of life. To such a degree that it's ridiculous for me to even suggest to you that, hey, maybe your life would be improved by going living in a cave. Now, the problem is that as soon as I bring that up as a, even a thought experiment, the typical mind recoils at that notion because it loves all its creature comforts. And it says stuff like, well, Leo, are you really saying that I must go live in a cave to become enlightened? What about Eckhart Tolle? What about somebody else? What about this guy here? He didn't go live in a cave. He seems to be a normal guy. I'm not saying that you must live in a cave. I'm merely put in putting this out there as a thought experiment, as an illustration, to see the extent of the distractions that are in your life. And also so that you notice some of these uh, negative characterizations that mainstream society puts into your mind. Because mainstream society tells you that if you go outside of mainstream society, that is bad out there. It's terrible. It's, it's, a, it's a wasteland out there. You can't be happy without your cell phone. You can't be happy without internet and without porn and without alcohol, without partying, without girls, without guys, without children, without family. You can't be happy with any, without any of that stuff. You need all that stuff. You see, and then you believe it, and then now you're stuck playing this game, not realizing that it's a game. Also, I put this example out there about living in a cave is because I want you to see that actually your process of becoming conscious, if you are interested in becoming conscious and also be still staying within mainstream society, that your process will be much more difficult than it is for yogis and monks who go live in caves. It might seem like, well, the yogis and monks, you know, they're very hardcore. They spend, uh, they're all, all day meditating and, and not eating very much and living in these very uh, Spartan conditions. It seems like torture. In a certain sense, yes. But also in a certain sense, once you're in that situation, and you acclimate to it a little bit, and you extricate yourself from the bubble of mainstream society, you're gonna you're gonna experience a flip where it's actually gonna be the opposite. You're gonna notice that how much more difficult it is to be conscious living as a householder, with a family, with a business, with pursuing sex and drugs and partying and all this stuff. That's the really difficult thing, is becoming awakened while still doing all of that, it's virtually impossible. Now, I don't want to say that you need to go in a li and live in a cave in order to become enlightened or to become more conscious. That's not true. It's possible. I'm just saying it's almost impossible. And how do I know that? Because 99.999% of people are in mainstream society and they are not conscious. And you can see that just by turning on Fox News or any news channel. I'm not saying Fox News. I mean, Fox News is a, is a particularly good example. But even if you turn on CNN and stuff like that, you still see it. Okay. You still see it. People's entire careers on CNN, very reasonable people, centrist people. They're not particular radicals or right-wingers or left-wing, just very centrist people on CNN, their entire careers are still red herrings. As though reporting on the news is what your life is supposed to be about. You see, once you get caught in that cycle of reporting on the news and getting paid millions of dollars for it, you'll do that for the rest of your life. It's the same as hooking up a rat to a little morphine injection and giving him the button. He's going to be pushing that button until he dies. You know, they, they've done these experiments in labs where they actually do this with a rat. That rat will push that button until it kills itself with an overdose. And that's just exactly what's happening with very successful people. I'm talking about the wealthiest, the most powerful celebrities, business people, most intelligent scientists, 
they're all just rats pushing that button. It's quite remarkable to see this. Now, uh, a very important objection that comes up here is people, people say the following when they hear this. They say, well, Leo, it sounds like you're bad-mouthing family and religion and you're bad-mouthing business and you're bad-mouthing success and you're bad-mouthing sex and relationships and you're saying that all this stuff is evil and it's a sin and now I feel like I'm being moralized to. And that all this stuff is bad. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing bad at all in the world. Nothing is bad. Bad doesn't exist. No action is bad. Go play video games if you want. There's nothing wrong or bad about playing video games. You don't need to stop doing anything in particular. But watch out because when I say that, What's going to be the most likely thing you do? You're going to fall back into your mainstream cultural habits and conditions and just go about doing all this stuff unconsciously without seeing the elephant in the room. And you're going to waste your entire life. You're going to piss away your entire life if you're not very, very careful right here. So even though technically nothing is bad and nothing is wrong and you can do anything you want, you can go murder people if you want. From an absolute perspective, there's nothing wrong with it. But from a practical perspective, there's a lot wrong with it. Because what you're going to end up doing is creating a miserable sort of life. You are the one who is paying the toll for the life that you lead. I mean, other people are too. If you go around murdering people, of course they suffer. But what people don't see is that you suffer and that you're missing something way bigger in life. You're chasing the really small fish when there's a whale to be landed. Land the fucking whale. Don't lose sight of the big picture by getting sucked into your career or into your family or into your relationships or into sex or into pickup or into Wall Street money chasing and whatever hobbies of, of whatever stupid sort, you know, collecting a bottle caps or whatever. Don't get sucked into this shit. Which is not to say you can't do it. If you want to go collect bottle caps, go collect some bottle caps, but just put it in perspective. Make that an ancillary aspect of your life. The problem happens when you make it the primary feature of your life. You become a bottle col cap collector, then you make a career about bottle cap collecting, and you start to spread bottle cap collecting as an idea throughout society, and you sell, sell millions of bottle caps, and you become a millionaire, and then it seems like, well, look, I've aced life. No, you haven't aced life. You got distracted. You lost track of the big picture. So I'm not moralizing to you here. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do anything. You can do whatever you want. But be mindful of the consequences of where that will lead you. Your actions have consequences. And then you are the one who mostly pays for those consequences. Uh, here's a good metaphor for really illustrating this point. Imagine you're in Disneyland. And it's fun there. You're with your family and your kids. And you're all there together. And you're going on the rides. And you're eating the good food. And all the greasy food they got. And it's so fun and exciting. And all that's happening. It's like your first time there. And then I run up to you and say, Hey, guys, we got to get out of here. Stop these rides. Stop eating this food. Put all this down. There's a giant hurricane coming. Giant fucking hurricane is coming. And you listen to me and you're like, oh, Okay, a hurricane. But Leo, are you saying, are you really saying that the rides in Disneyland are bad? Are you saying that this churro that I'm eating is bad and that my kids and my family is bad? It sounds like you're, you're dismissing this whole thing. What's so wrong with going to Disneyland and enjoying myself? Leo, it's just fun. What's wrong with fun? What's wrong with some adventure? Just relax, man. Relax. Don't be so anal about it. 
But you see, of course, I'm not telling you that there's anything wrong with being in Disneyland per se. If you want to go to Disneyland, go to Disneyland. That's fine. Enjoy the rides there. Enjoy the greasy food, whatever. Enjoy your family. But realize that there's a hurricane coming. What is the hurricane? It's the end of your life. You will die, you realize that? And it'll come much sooner than you think. And when you're on your deathbed, what are you going to have to show for it? How are you going to feel? What's your connection to life going to be when you're going through that process? As you're aging, you're getting to your 60s and 70s and 80s. What's going to happen there? What's your whole life going to be about? Most people, when they get to that point, if they're still lucky to have some wits left, um, they're going to realize that they have been in Disneyland gorging themselves on churros and riding these rides incessantly to the point where they just got sick of them. And now the hurricane has come. And now they're screwed. And what I want you to realize is that all these rides, they are fun. Society is an amusement park for the ego, as I've said before. But the hurricane is coming. And it is possible to prepare yourself for this hurricane. And the way that you do that is by awakening, by doing the consciousness work, by doing all the stuff that I've talked about in all my other hundreds of videos. That's what this is about. Getting that ultimate big picture is very important. And making sure to prioritize your ultimate big picture over everything else is very important. If you get it sort of, but then you prioritize it low on your list, like number five, number 10, you don't got it. To really get what I'm saying here, you prioritize this to number one, number two, and number three. All those top three slots are filled with this, and then everything else can still happen. You can still go to Disneyland, but that's like number 10 or number 15 on your list. In Islam, they have a very interesting concept called forgetfulness, which I like. Do you know why in Islam they uh, they pray? They're supposed to pray five times a day. That's a lot. You pray when you wake up. You pray <laughs> like mid-morning. You play in the, pay, pray in the afternoon. You, you pray in the evening. And then you pray right before you go to bed. That's a lot of praying every single day. That's quite a hassle. Why don't they do that? The logic of it is, is that if you don't take precautions to think about life at an existential level or to pray, you know, uh, if you don't take those precautions every single minute of the day, you will forget because your mind is that tricky and it gets that easily distracted. So they came up with five times per day. I actually heard a story. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm not a scholar of Islam or anything. Um, but I heard a story that originally to, um, to Muhammad, when he had his mystical experiences with the angel Gabriel, that's supposedly how he, um, how he wrote the Quran is through this sort of channeling process, that he sort of like went up to Gabriel and asked him, okay, so what do I need to do to to be spiritual. And somehow he got the answer that, well, you need to pray in this way and you got to wash your hands and wash your face. And, you know, so that he got all the kind of the minutia of how to, of how to structure Islam from that, um, and how to structure his, his spiritual practices. But the story is from what I recall is that, um, Gabriel told him something like, well, you got to pray like a hundred or a thousand times a day. And Muhammad, and Muhammad's like, a thousand times a day? I can't pray a thousand times a day. That's too much. I wouldn't have any day left to do anything else. I can't just be praying 24-7. I got to, like, eat and feed my family and, you know, do the stuff human beings got to do. And so somehow there was, like, a negotiation process. I don't know if this is actually true or not, but this is a, this is a nice little story. 
So there's like a negotiation process between him and, him and Gabriel. It's like, well, Gabriel's like, okay, well, a hundred times. And Muhammad's like, no, a hundred times is still too much. You can't do a hundred times. It's not practical. So it's like, okay, fine. Let, let's get it down to, to five. So eventually they got it down to five times a day. So this, uh, this little story I like because it just goes to show you that really you should be doing it a thousand times a day. You should be waking up. You should be meditating all the fucking time. You should be mindful all the fucking time. You're taking a shit. You should be mindful. You're taking a shower. You should be mindful. Brushing your teeth. You should be mindful. This is so hard because we forget. See, the problem with, uh, with talking about Islam and so forth and living in a cave is that people tend to hate religious abstentions. Like when they are told no sex, no alcohol, no drugs, no partying, none of the fun stuff. And then they think, oh, well, these religious people, they're so uptight that they're just anti-fun. They demonize all of the, all the cool stuff in life. But see, there's really uh, two different ways or two different kinds of abstention. One, con one kind of abstinence is when you do it because you're told to do it from an external authority. So when your Bible tells you no sex, no alcohol, no pork, no shellfish, no drugs, no partying, and so forth, or when your you know, rabbi tells you this, whatever, and then you do that out of obligation, that's a very low consciousness unspiritual way of going about this. The reason that religions and mystical traditions all around the world have these various abstentions, and they're found in all religions, including Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, whatever, Islam, is because if you're serious about spirituality, like the hardcore mystics were who ultimately sourced these religions, um, you have to find a way to work around the distractions of your culture, which includes sex, drugs, party, alcohol. So the worst of the distractions, you have to find a way to minimize those. And you see that those distractions are actually, they're not just distractions, they're also low consciousness activities, which are really antithetical to pursuing the elephant in the room. And therefore, as you become more conscious, you will naturally discard these things. You will tend to discard them. Not entirely, not in a rigid fashion, but you'll just gravitate away from them. You're never going to see them as a sin. It's actually going to be the opposite. You're not going to see sex as a sin or alcohol as a sin. Nothing is going to look like a sin. Everything is going to look like beautiful life. But to get to that point you're going to have to abstain from stuff. Because otherwise, you're never going to awaken. See, there's a very big difference from looking at the world from a position of pre-awakening versus post-awakening. A lot of the mistake that people make when they're thinking about pursuing consciousness and awakening is they tend to listen to teachers who are already goddamn awake, awake as fuck, and have been for 40 years, like these spiritual masters, they listen to them and they think, oh, well, I'll just do what they're telling me. But that master is talking from 40 years of post-awakening. Not from a pre-awakening perspective. From a pre-awakening perspective, you got to be working your ass off and abstaining from a lot of stuff, practically, to awaken. From a post-awakening perspective, you can just say, oh, well, you've, everything is fine. You can do whatever the fuck you want. You don't have to practice anything. You're already enlightened. Everything is fine. There's nothing to do and nowhere to go. That's only from the post-awakening perspective. You don't have that luxury when you ain't awake yet. You see? So watch out. None of these things are bad. That's what makes them so tempting. You can't say that these things are bad. That would actually be untrue. So to say that alcohol or sex or whatever is a sin, that's untrue. To say you shouldn't do it, that's untrue. So in that sense, many secular people are right. Because a lot of the problem that secular people have with religious people say, well, the religious people believe in all these archaic limitations towards life. And you know what? That's so stingy. I don't like that. It seems very anti-human. Let's just be cool and kind of liberal with everything. But the problem with that, even though that is a step up from 
you know, hardcore right wing radical fundamentalism. It's a step up from that, but it's not that high of a step up because now you're stuck with all the sex, alcohol, drugs, and partying and all that. And now you're so distracted and chasing so many red herrings that you have fallen into the trap that the religious hardcore fundamentalists were trying to save you from. Now, of course, their way of saving you by moralizing to you and demonizing these activities, that was not going to work. It doesn't work. That's why we see problems, for example, in the Catholic Church where these priests molest and abuse children because they are told that they can't have a wife, they can't have sex with normal adults, so therefore, you know, <laughs> that drive, because that drive is not made conscious and it's rejected and it's demonized as a sin, it comes out even worse as uh, pedophilia. So you can't just deny these things. The highest level of abstinence is not abstinence in a moralistic fashion or in an ideological fashion. You're not abstaining because you don't agree with it ideologically. You're abstaining because you see that you would rather have the truth than some, some cheap sex or some cheap alcohol or some party to go to. You see, you develop a love for the truth, a love for consciousness, for being awake, such that you don't want to tarnish it with very low consciousness activities. In the same way that right now, if you're going to school and you're earning good grades, let's say, or if you're uh, running your own business and you're earning some good money and you're getting some good progress from your business, you're working on your life purpose, maybe you have a nice family, things are going kind of good for you in your life. And now I give you a heroin needle and I say, here's some heroin injected into your veins. A person who has a happy life overall has stuff going for them. They're not going to inject that heroin. You see, why not? Is it because the heroin is a sin? No, simply because they have some degree of awakeness and they can see that if I inject this heroin, it's just, I'm, I'm going to spiral downwards. It's not a sin. There's nothing bad about doing heroin. You can do heroin, no problem. But there is a problem in that it'll send you down this spiral of chasing lower and lower consciousness things. And most normal people realize that, which is why they wouldn't even do heroin if it was sold in their pharmacy. But of course, people who don't have a lot going for them, they have nothing to lose. So they do heroin and then they get caught in that trap. But now replace heroin with your family, your career, the money, the sex, and all the stuff that mainstream society tells you is okay. What are the takeaways from this episode? Very practically, I want you to start to notice all the little distractions and big distractions that you experience every single day. I want you to look at micro distractions as in just little things. So like when you're sitting down to meditate and then you're distracted by something, maybe it starts to rain while you're meditating and then that becomes a distraction and you start thinking about the rain. Okay, notice that as a, as a micro distraction. Also look out for the macro distractions. Macro distractions are things like thinking about having some children, maybe when you shouldn't yet, or trying to, maybe you have a little business, but now you're trying to expand it and you're having these dreams about growing your business bigger and bigger and bigger. And now you might start to notice like, oh, that whole chain of never ending business expansion, that might be a macro distraction or getting caught up in, in politics and maybe arguing and debating and becoming an ideologue and just notice that, wait, all this finger pointing and criticizing and arguing that I do, might that be a, a, a macro distraction? Because I seem to be doing a lot of it. Just start to notice that. I'm not even saying that you have to abstain from anything yet. I'm just saying start to notice it. Start to watch it as it happens. That begins the process of becoming aware. As I've talked about in my awareness is cura awareness alone is curative episode. Just by becoming more mindful of these things, the problem will start to fix itself slowly, just slowly by watching it. 
another important takeaway here is it's okay to get distracted. I don't want you to demonize distraction because what will happen is you start to notice the distraction and you say, start saying to yourself, oh man, I'm such a bad person. I can't meditate. I can't do anything Leo is saying. I'm such a fuck up. And then you start to feel a little guilty about it. Be careful about judging yourself. You have to appreciate that this mechanism of the mind is what allows you to exist. It's a very powerful mechanism. Your entire life hinges upon it. So it's not going to get disassembled and deconstructed easily. It's going to it's going to employ a lot of tricks. It's going to take a lot of time, probably years for this whole process to unfold. So don't judge yourself. If you make mistakes, if you get distracted, even despite your best efforts, just realize that really it's not up to you. This is a force of nature. In the same way that if you were in the middle of a hurricane and you were getting blown over, you wouldn't guilt yourself for that too much. You realize that it's a force. It's a very powerful force of nature. A hurricane is much more powerful than you are. Well, this distraction, your own mind, I'm telling you, it's a more powerful force than a Category 5 hurricane. It's much stronger. It's much more consistent. It'll stay with you for the rest of your life unless you really make some, some mindful efforts to overcome it. The key is to stay mindful of the mechanism and not let your mind get turned outward too much. Just stay mindful. If you can just stay mindful of how this inward outward process is going, it's like some days you're so focused outward, you completely forget about the inward aspect of your life. Some days you're focused inward, you kind of forget about the outward. Sometimes it's a bit of both, right? So if you just kind of start to see this happening throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your life, watching that mechanism a lot will help you to become conscious. Over time, you'll start to get a sense and a feel for what's really going on and why it's happening. And actually, you start to appreciate the raw power of these defense mechanisms of the mind. Appreciate them. Don't demonize them. Don't beat yourself up over falling into them. They're very sneaky traps. 99.999% of people in the world are trapped by them, and they will never break free. They will not even break free if you show them this episode. They will still not break free. They will not even break free if you show them all 300 or so of the episodes that I currently have. They will still not break free. In fact, the episodes will just become another distraction for them. Because it's layer upon layer upon layer of distraction. The distractions are woven into each other. And they happen on the micro and the macro level and everything in between. Start appreciating that raw power. It's actually a rather beautiful thing when you see it. It's an ingenious design. It's an ingenious design of nature that our minds work this way. Start to appreciate that. Another takeaway is to just be mindful of how these mechanisms are working in society. Notice the structures that are built by our society and by our culture and how they reinforce and play into these traps and that they make them worse. Again, the mistake here would then be to demonize society or to demonize other people for inventing these things. But you have to recognize that this is a much larger force than any one individual or even any one politician or any one government or any one culture. These forces are much, much, much larger than that. This is the overarching force of ignorance. This whole process is a process of the universe becoming conscious of itself. And it starts from a position of low consciousness and moves towards a position of higher consciousness. You see, it's sort of an evolutionary process. And it's always a struggle. And this is the struggle that you see throughout all of history, throughout all of humanity, throughout all of science, throughout all of technology, throughout all of religion. It's this, it's this process. And this process is not a straight, linear, upward line like this. It's a wavy, sort of up and down and jaggedy sort of thing. But overall, it's, it trends upwards, but it's like, whew, like this. And you never know when you're stuck in the bottom here. 
You see, and it takes it takes thousands of years for this stuff to really shift. So start to notice what society is. And remember that I am not telling you to become a workaholic. I am not telling you to become a moralist. I am not telling you to be religious. I am not telling you to be anal about life and to deny yourself the pleasures of life. The whole point of abstaining from lower consciousness things is so that you can get to higher consciousness things and then when you're at the very highest consciousness things and you have your awakening, really, a really deep one, then everything in life becomes joy. And you're not just cherry picking. The problem with low consciousness stuff is that you have to cherry pick and all your happiness becomes contingent on you successfully cherry picking the right stuff. Like, yeah, if you have heroin to inject into your veins, you're happy. Otherwise, you're not. You see? That's a very limited ability to enjoy life. Your ability to enjoy life at that point is like this. It's tiny. Whereas as you become more conscious by abstaining from stuff, it might seem like, well, but I'm, but I'm rejecting life. Yes, at first it seems that way. But then there's a sort of inversion. The thing goes full circle and actually then everything becomes open to you. And then you can just sit, do nothing. And it feels like you have heroin flowing through your veins. So in a sense, Spirituality is really the most hedonistic way to live, but it's a, it's a, it's the exact opposite of hedonism, especially when you're trying to get it going. See, this tricks a lot of people because this is very counterintuitive. It's like you seem like it seems like you're going one direction, but you're actually going the opposite. That tends to be how the mind works. It works in 180 degree um, reversals like that. Of course, I'm not immune to any of this. Um, I have a lot of distractions in my life. And one of my macro distractions is Actualize.org. Actualize.org is a huge distraction for me. Um, I still think it's important and I have reasons for why I'm doing it. And I'm not sure where it's going to go in the future. Maybe it'll stop at some point. Maybe it won't. I don't know. It might evolve. Uh, I might quit eventually at some point. Uh, I mean, uh, totally at some point, but, um, but I recognize that it's a distraction. A distraction doesn't necessarily mean you need to quit it. Watch it, become conscious of it and watch out that actualize.org doesn't become a distraction for you. That's also very easy because on the one hand, you do need the theory. The theory is very important. You also need the motivation. You do need someone to inspire you and to help wake you up every single week. There are important functions there that Actualize.org is serving, but also it could easily be overused. I hear about some people watching all my episodes three times over and over and over again. <laughs> That's probably too much. Probably too much. Don't turn this into a philosophical mental masturbation exercise. But then again, if you need to do that, then do it. You have to figure that out. There's a fine balancing act here. And like I talked about in my balancing episode, the importance of balance in personal development. Um, no one can tell you what the right balance is for you. That's part of this whole growth process is discovering what that balance is. You don't even know what that balance is until you roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please remember to click that like button for me and come check out Actualize.org, my website right here. I have some resources for you there. The forum, which can be a distraction, but it can also have some valuable content on there and some motivation and some help. Uh, my blog, the Life Purpose course, the book list, and I want to release more um, content in the future that's going to be exclusively available there. So stick with me for more.